Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's track on cell biology of diseases. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sergio Grinstein, senior scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children and professor of biochemistry at the University of Toronto. Dr. Grinstein was an international scholar of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a recipient of the Medical Research Council Distinguished Scientist Award and of the Michael Smith Award of the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. He is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Grinstein's keynote presentation is titled Phagocytosis, Macropinocytosis, and the Init Immune Response, Recent Advances. My name is Michelle Ashton, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know you are experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sergio Grinstein. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Hello, good morning. What I uh, want to do today is discuss some aspects of the innate immune response, the one that is mediated by myeloid cells, primarily macrophages and dendritic cells and neutrophils. Most of the results and general mechanisms that I'll discuss today will relate to macrophages, but in many ways they apply to all other myeloid cells. We know primarily about the innate immune system in the context of eliminating invading microorganisms. This slide shows invading bacteria in blue being approached and attacked by a macrophage shown in yellow. The macrophage is able to recognize, adhere to, and engulf and kill the bacteria, eliminating potential pathogens. That is certainly the best known function of cells of the immune system. However, we tend to overlook an equally or perhaps more important function, which is the role of phagocytic cells in tissue homeostasis. In each one of us human individuals, approximately 50 to 200 billion cells die every day. They turn over and when they die, they don't go to heaven. They actually have to be buried, and the undertaker is normally the macrophage, which means that every second macrophages in our body have to dispose of five to 10 million dead cells. <clears throat> Those two are not the only functions of phagocytic cells. In the central nervous system, for instance, remodeling of synapses during learning or the process of forgetting is mediated by a specialized phagocytic cell called the microglia, which is really a glorified macrophage. So what is phagocytosis? Well, phagocytosis refers to the process of engulfment and disposition of particulate material, usually greater than half a micron in diameter. It can be a bacterium, it could be a dead hypotonic cell. Receptors recognize the particle that they're interested in, engulf it in what is called phagosome formation, and once a vacuole is formed that contains the target particle, that vacuole undergoes a process that's called maturation, which leads to the degradation, killing degradation, and disposal 
of the material that has been internalized. The whole event is actually receptor mediated, and it's key to recognize properly the target particles, be they bacteria, fungi, or dead cells. Receptors on the surface of the phagocytic cell recognize ligands on the particle. And because the ligands are immobilized and because the ligands are multiple, they result in cross-linking and clustering of the phagocytic receptors. And these receptors signal a series of reactions that is complicated and very elegant that ultimately lead to the formation of pseudopods that extend to engulf the particle. The initial step in general is thought to be the activation of a tyrosine kinase, usually a SARC family kinase. Subsequently, in the cascade of events, are lipid kinases, PI3 kinase being an important one. And just as a reminder, phosphoinositides are extremely important, very specialized signaling molecules. There are a variety of different phosphoinositides, seven species in particular, which are interconverted by the actions of lipid kinases and lipid phosphatases. The reason why these specialized phospholipids are important is because they are recognized by defined domains or motifs on proteins in the cell and serve for the recruitment and activation of a variety of different proteins. So as shown on this slide, there are domains that recognize PI4P and others that recognize PI45P2, et cetera. Not only has it been important to define the binding domains of these effector proteins, but scientists have actually taken advantage of this knowledge to identify the portions of the proteins that recognize the individual phospholipids, excise them from the target proteins, and use them as probes to detect the presence and abundance and dynamics of individual lipids. Thus, one can use a pH domain to look at PIP2 or a PX domain to detect PI3P. The way most laboratories have engineered these domains is by generating chimeric constructs with fluorescent proteins. And so a head group of PIP2 or PIP3 by rec being recognized by a specific domain that is in turn attached to a fluorescent protein will be localized in a live cell through transfection of a plasmid that encodes for the specific chimeric protein. In the case, for instance, of PI345 P3, our laboratory and others have used extensively the pH domain of AKT, a kinase, that's shown to the right in this slide. And as will be shown in the following movie, expression of the pH domain of AKT into a macrophage results in diffuse fluorescence of the probe in a cell that is not activated, but during the course of phagocytosis, as should be apparent from the following movie, there is an exquisitely localized transient accumulation of the probe, indicating the formation of PIP3 precisely and exclusively at sites where phagosomes are being formed. And the accumulation, as will be shown in the movie, is transient as the PIP3 disappears shortly after the phagosome is sealed. Using a similar approach and varying the nature of the probe that has been used to identify individual lipids, 
we have come to learn that individual stages of the formation of a phagosome are characterized and in fact driven and signaled by a particular phosphoinositide. So the resting cell has PIP2, which is converted into PIP3. There's generation of PI3P, and in the late stages accumulation of PI4P. And this correlates with the appearance of specific markers of individual stages of the maturation of the phagos. What I've told you so far are generalities of the process of phagocytosis. What I want to do now is discuss two specific short projects in my laboratory dealing in one case with phagocytosis, which as I mentioned is the process of eating particulate material. The second one, as you will see later, deals not with eating but drinking by the same cells. The process of macrophagocytosis or the gulping of large volumes of fluid. So the first small vignette that I'll present is work of a student in my laboratory, Philip Ostrovsky, who has been studying the mechanism underlying the engulfment of particles during phagocytosis. And as will be shown in the following movie, phagocytosis requires the extension of pseudopods that surround and ultimately engulf the particle. This process is driven by the polymerization of actin. What the movie in front of you is showing is the accumulation of F-actin, the polymerized form of actin, at the base of the phagocytic cup and then progressing along the pseudopods as they travel along the surface of the target particle and ultimately engulf it and take it up. As I mentioned before, the process is initiated by the cross-linking of receptors. SARC family kinases are an early event. I also showed you that phosphoinositides are involved, but ultimately the main response is driven by the polymerization of actin. The mechanical effects are driven by actin. And the question that Philip asked is how close physically are the receptors from the site where the actin is polymerized? There is no obvious physical connection between them and it wasn't clear what the physical relation between these two events are. And so the question was, can we simultaneously detect the site where the receptors are being cross-linked and activated and the place where the actin is polymerized? In principle, modern techniques of imaging are sufficiently rapid and sufficiently uh, of high resolution to enable us to look at these types of relationships. The unique problem presented by phagocytosis, however, is that whereas proper microscopic determinations require the establishment of a well-defined focal plane, particularly when performing a focal microscopy, in the case of phagocytosis, the three-dimensional nature of the engulfment process makes it virtually impossible to track the entire event. As the cells are extending pseudopods, the particle is being driven into the cell so how do we overcome this challenge? And what we decided to do was rather than try to keep refocusing the focal plane was to convince the cells to perform phagocytosis at a single focal plane. And we accomplished this by coating the surface of a cover slip with a ligand that the cells prefer to phagocytose, namely an immunoglobulin. So what you're seeing in the present image is a cover slip that has been homogeneously coated with immunoglobulin, and the blue circle represents a macrophage that is being parachuted from the medium onto the surface of the glass. 
And in essence, what we will be asking that cell to accomplish is to try to attach and engulf the surface of the copper slip. And indeed, these cells have an enormous appetite and a great ability to distend their membranes, and they try to open the big mouth to eat the entire copper slip. What is shown in the next movie is the polymerization of actin, as we illustrated before, but this time in two dimensions. And you can imagine yourselves as lying underneath the cover slip, watching upwards the efforts of the macrophage to open a big mouth and try to engulf the entire surface. As you can see, upon contact, acting polymerizes at the site of attachment, but very quickly, the circumference of the attachment site increases, actin spreads outward, and as should be obvious, you'll notice that not only does the actin polymerize towards the periphery, but it gradually depolymerizes and disappears from the center of the phagocytic cup. Another point to note is that the structure of the actin as it migrates outward is punctate. Now, this system enabled us to look in a single focal plane over rather extended, extended periods of time at the distribution of actin. However, because the entire cover slip was covered with the ligand and the actin was progressing, it was nevertheless difficult to discern the relative position of the actin and that of the receptor. So we made the experiment somewhat more complicated and perhaps somewhat more elegant by instead of forcing the cells to engage ligand spread over the entire surface of the glass, as I showed you in the previous movie, where the result is the opening of one big mouth of actin as the cell endeavors to eat the entire cover slip, what we did instead was to spot the ligand using micro patterning into two micron little spots separated by six microns of uncoated surface. And in essence, what we were asking the cells to do is not to open one big mouth as they did in the left panel, but to open many little mouths around each one of the individual micro pattern spots of ligand. And what you're seeing on the panel at the bottom right is, in fact, staining for F actin in green, whereas the distribution of the ligand and hence presumably the site where the receptors were accumulated is shown in red. And in fact, if under similar micro patterning conditions, we now detect the site of accumulation, cross linking and activation of the receptors which is shown in blue here, and compare it to actin, we can now see on the two insets on the right that the area of the position of the ligand, the micro pattern red spot, is indeed where the receptors bind and where the receptors cross link and become accumulated. That's the top right panel. Whereas the bottom right panel shows the distribution of actin. And what was striking, and I think is immediately obvious, is that the actin is not particularly polymerized and accumulated at the very same site where the receptors are engaged, but is doing so around them in a halo structure that is around one to two microns away from the site of maximal activation of the receptors. In molecular terms, one to two microns is a huge distance. So what is happening? And to make a long story short, and what is shown in this particular series of images, is that the site where the actin polymerizes is not where the micro pattern spot, shown in this case in blue, is located, but around it. And that is an area where integrins, which are adherence receptors, become activated. You can see that the in activated integrins shown in red 
co-localize much better with the green actin than does the micropatrin ligand or the cross-linked receptor. Just as a reminder, integrins are adhesion receptors. They normally bind to extracellular matrix proteins, and they internally attach to tailin and vinculin, which in turn serve to bridge the integrins with the actin cytoskeleton, shown as blue beads in this case. We proceeded to look in greater detail at the integrin associated proteins and actin in the context of frustrated phagocytosis. Now, in this case, we use a more sophisticated type of microscopy, which is STEP, stimulated emission depletion microscopy, to look in more detail at the relative distribution of actin and the integrin proteins. And what you can see to the left is the mouth open. The same pattern in general is observed in the middle panel for vinculin. If you look now at the panel to the right, and if you zoom into these structures, you will notice a particular arrangement between the actin, which is shown in red, and vinculin, which is shown in green. And vinculin, remember, is the protein that associates with the integrins. Okay, so what do we know about integrin structure and its accumulation on the surface of cells? The best known example is the formation of focal adhesions, which we're familiar with from a variety of cultured cells. And this is illustrated in this slide where you can see adherent integrins binding to vinculin and tailin, which in turn attach to filaments of actin. So are we looking in the case of phagocytosis at focal adhesions similar to these? So as should be evident from this slide, whereas some of the same proteins are present in both prototypical focal adhesions and in the structures formed during frustrated phagocytosis, as shown in the left panels, their distribution is not identical. And more importantly, there are a couple of proteins which seem to be present in the integrin-mediated structures in phagocytosis that are not present in focal adhesions. And these are HS1, which is a homologue of cortactin, and also ARPC2, which is a component of the ARP2-3 complex. Both of them are present in phagocytosis, absent from conventional focal adhesions. So instead, we believe we're looking at a structure that may be analogous to what is shown in this other slide, potosomes. Potosomes are structures that are uniquely found in cancerous cells and also in some myeloid cells. What is shown to the left is a macrophage at rest adhering to the substratum, and to the right, the detail of potosomes, which show the integrins, tailin, and vinculin, but in contrast to a focal adhesion, they form a circle around a pillar of actin that runs perpendicular to the plasma membrane. So are we looking in phagocytosis at structures that are more analogous to polysomes? And indeed, when you look at all their features, they're extremely similar, and both of them contain HS1, and both of them contain ARP23. So are we merely looking at the formation acutely of polysomes during phagocytosis? We decided, therefore, to compare the features of resting polysomes with the structures that are formed during <clears throat> frustrated phagocytosis. And as will be obvious from the following couple of movies that are running side by side, there are two very marked differences between the two structures, even though they are superficially similar. The potosomes present in resting cells remain over very extended periods of time in the same general area, and their half-life is quite long. Conversely, during frustrated phagocytosis, 
there is a vectorial displacement of the formation of these podosome-like structures, and I will call them from now on podosome-like structures, as the phagosomal cup or phagosomal mouth progresses outward. We quantified the half-life of both types of podosomes, and it should be obvious that those form on resting cells have a much longer half-life, they're shown in the first two bars, compared to the ones that are shorter lived in phagocytosis. But perhaps more striking is the vectorial nature of the dynamics of the formation of the podosome like structures during phagocytosis, which is shown on the top row. And it's contrasted to the podosomes in the resting cell at the bottom. And if you compare the time shown in green and the time shown in red for phagosome formation, you will notice that there has been a clear vectorial directional displacement of the podosome-like structures during phagocytosis, whereas in resting cells, they generally remain within the same area and they turn over much more slowly. So structures are similar but not identical. So what dictates the directionality of podosomes? Why is their lifetime different in the podosome-like structures during phagocytosis? And so we suspected the involvement of phosphoenocytides, which is the reason why I introduced phosphoenocytides as signaling determinants during phagocytosis in the beginning of this talk. So we asked, is it known from the literature whether podosomes require phosphoenocytides, in particular, PIP2. To test whether polysomes require PIP2, we engineered cells to express a heterobifunctional system where a phospholipase that is able to hydrolyze PIP2 can be recruited to the membrane at the time of our choice by addition of a liganding molecule called rapamycin. Rapamycin will enter the cells, will be bound to a membrane determinant that have, has been transfected, and will in turn recruit active phospholipase to the membrane at the time of our choosing. Upon recruitment, the phospholipase will chew up phosphatidylinositol 4 5 bisphosphate or PIP2. And we can therefore assess immediately the effects and the requirement for PIP2 on the formation of polosomes. So what is shown in this image in the top right is a resting macrophage where you can see polosomes formed on the top left of the cell very distinctly. They will remain there for very extended periods of time, except in a transfected cell that has a heterodimerization system the addition of rapamycin results in the recruitment of the phospholysis lipase disappearance of PIP2 and within seconds, complete disappearance of the polosomes. So these kinds of experiments taught us that indeed the maintenance of polosomes and possibly polosome-like structures requires the presence of PIP2 at the memory. What is the fate of PIP2 during the process of phagocytosis? We used the very same approach that I mentioned before. We utilized a domain of a protein known to recognize the head group of PIP2, made a chimeric construct with a green fluorescent protein, and expressed it in cells prior to phagocytosis. And what should be apparent from this pseudocolored image where we show a macrophage in the process of eating a bead shown in as the white circle, you will see that whereas PIP2 is present throughout the rest of the membrane and in fact accumulated near the base of the phagocytic cup, at the very bottom, the PIP2 is beginning to disappear or has disappeared entirely as shown by the area pointed to by the arrow 
in this slide. That is a three-dimensional theocytic event. We also looked at two-dimensional events where we can better control the disposition of the receptors. And what is shown in the panel to the right is a pseudocolor image of the distribution of PIP2 during the course of frustrated phagocytosis, where blue or cool colors indicate very low concentrations, yellow and red indicate higher concentrations, and this should be obvious, whereas there is plenty of PIP2 at the edges of the cell, the center of the cell in the course of frustrated phagocytosis has lost a great deal of the PIP2. And that is perhaps more apparent if you make an XZ or sagittal slice of the cell. This is a reconstruction from confocal images. At the top, you see a resting cell adherent to glass where there's no phagocytic event taking place. And you can see that PIP2 is homogeneously distributed throughout the cell. Both dorsal and ventral membranes are rich in PIP2. By comparison, the image at the bottom shows a macrophage that has been parachuted onto the immunoglobulin and is trying to eat the cover slip. In the process, it has spread much more widely than a cell that is growing on uncoated glass. But perhaps more importantly, the PIP2 at the base of the cell, in the center of the phagocytic cup, has been virtually eliminated and in contrast to the dorsal membrane, there is practically no PIP2 left. There is, however, PIP2 near the edges of the phagocytic cup. And that is precisely the area where the bosom-like structures remain. And so what we believe is that the disappearance progressively of PIP2 from the center of the cup may be dictating the progressive and vectorial disappearance of the polosome-like structures driving in a polarized manner the formation of the phagosome. Can we test that hypothesis? Well, that turns out to be a relatively simple experiment because there are well-described and quite potent inhibitors of the phospholipase that is thought to mediate the disappearance of PIP2 during phagocytosis, which is phospholipase C-gamma. A compound called U73122 has been used extensively to inhibit the kinase. And so what we questioned then was what would be the fate and dynamics of the bosom-like structures if we prevented the disappearance of PIP2. And just to remind you, under normal conditions, in the absence of any inhibitors, the actin disappears from the center and extends around the edges of the phagocytic cup. By contrast, in cells that have been treated with the inhibitor of phospholipase C gamma, the phagocytic cup is initiated, the bosomes form in the center as well as in the periphery, but they fail to disappear from the center. And as a consequence, the phagocytic cup fails to expand completely and phagocytosis is aborted. So, there seems to be a directional displacement of polysome-like structures during phagocytosis. What is the purpose? What is the objective? And one way to analyze the event is to use a technique called interference reflection microscopy. In this technique, it is possible to assess the distance between the plasma membrane of the cell and the underlying surface. Dark areas indicate sites where the membrane is very tightly opposed to the substrate. Lighter areas show a air membrane that is further away. And I think the comparison of the two panels in the slide in front of you shows that the area where the potosome-like structures are being generated, which are green on the right panel, are those where the membrane is most closely opposed 
to the substrate. Not only do we think that the polysomes are pushing the membrane downwards, but we believe that there are contractile effects as well. What is shown in the current slide is the distribution of myosin around the phagocytic cup. And as we realized, myosin, which is a contractile protein, seems to be bridging the pillars of actin formed by the podosome-like structures. We therefore proposed that conceivably myosin was inducing a contractile effect very much like a perp spring that would help close the mouth of forming phagosome around the target. And to test this hypothesis, we collaborated with a group in North Carolina where we used a transparent and flexible membrane that was embedded with little fluorescent particles and coated with ligands for phagocytosis. If you make a top view of this membrane, you will see that the fluorescent particles that are embedded into the membrane are fairly homogeneously distributed. And the expectation was that should a macrophage land on top of that membrane and exert a contractile effect, we would see displacement inward of the individual fluorescent particles. And these experiments that were done in collaboration with a group in North Carolina could be computed and forces derived from the displacement of the particles could be converted into movies like the one that you will see next, where the pseudocolor scale indicates the strength of the forces and the direction of the arrows points in the direction where the forces are being exerted. And what this following movie will tell you is that indeed in the process of landing onto the surface, the cells are exerting a contractile force that tends to close the mouth of the phagocytic event. So in summary for this section, what we believe is happening during the process of phagocytosis is that there are two types of actin and two processes ongoing at the same time. At the very tip of the pseudopods, actin is pushing forward and making the phagocytic cup explore and advance and try to look for additional ligands. But in those places where the receptors have already been engaged, then protosome-like structures, like the ones shown in the preceding slides, push the membrane perpendicularly against the surface of the particle, firming up the interaction and also tethering myosin that exerts a contractile force that tends to secure and close the purse spring around the forming phagocytic cup. So this concludes the first section that I wanted to discuss that deals with the process of phagocytosis, which is shown in this slide near the middle. In the second section, I want to discuss the related but distinct process of macropinocytosis. Phagocytosis is about eating, macropinocytosis is about drinking. And again, cells of the innate immune system are not only very good eaters, but they're constant drinkers. They drink like sailors, and they do that because they want to be sampling the environment to look for signals of danger, signals of pathogens or antigens that they want to present to cells of the acquired immune system. So this second section will deal with work of my colleague, Dr. Spencer Freeman, and it relates to mycopinosomes and their fate. Now, in the next movie, I'll show you that even at rest, macrophages are extending past pseudopodia, 
and they yet generally retract, but on occasion they seal to form these very large and very noticeable vacuoles that are termed macropinosomes. Macropinosomes are formed on an ongoing basis, and as a result, these cells sample the medium in prodigious amounts. In fact, macrophages are estimated to drink a volume equivalent to their entire surface, their entire cytoplasm, pardon me, every hour. And in the process, internalize the equivalent of the total membrane surface every 20 to 30 minutes. It's a fantastic turnover and a great expense of energy. There are two types of micropinocytosis. One of them is ongoing constitutively, as you saw in the previous movie. The other one is actually exaggerated macropinocytosis in cells that have been stimulated by agents such as lipopolysaccharide or macrophage growth factor. In that case, the vacuoles formed are even larger and very obvious to observe by microscopy. What is shown in this slide are cells at rest to the left and cells that have been treated with macrophage colony stimulating factor. And you can see that within minutes, there's formation of very large, three to five micron in diameter mycopinosomes, these clear vacuoles that are seen at both ends of the cell. Now, the process of formation of the mycopinosomes is important, but as important, or perhaps more so, is what happens, what is the fate and disposition of the samples that have been taken up by mycopinocytosis. That requires processing, exposure to danger or inflammation receptors, and also transfer to antigen-presenting molecules. That all occurs in the process of maturation of the mycopinosome, whereby the large vacuole that's formed is remodeled into more specialized and smaller structures. This movie that we acquired courtesy of Dr. Robert Barton and Rohan Tisdale shows macropinosomes labeled with a protein called sortimnexin. And the point of the movie is to illustrate the extreme tubulation that occurs spontaneously shortly after the formation of the mycopinosome, which is very telling regarding the disposition of its contents. And what you'll see is a huge number and length of very fine tubules forming as the size of the overall vacuole decreases. Now, interestingly, we had never appreciated this, but we started thinking about the conversion of a large vacuole into small tubules. And there are very significant implications regarding the surface to volume ratio of these two types of structures. A sphere such as a macropinosome, if it has the three micron diameter that I mentioned as an example before, would have a surface to volume ratio of about two to one. If that same sphere is converted into narrow tubules, such as the ones illustrated in the movie, which are approximately 50 nanometers in diameter and can be quite long, maybe 10 microns, the surface to rate to volume ratio increases dramatically to about 40 to one or greater. So how does one go from a two to one surface to volume ratio to 40 to one? Well, there are two obvious possible mechanisms. One of them is to add additional surface, but it would seem very impractical and onerous on the cell to keep adding huge amounts of membrane to the already large amounts of membrane engulfed during mycopinocytosis. More conveniently, perhaps more expeditiously, and helping eliminate some of the fluid taken up is the reduction of volume from the vacuoles. And indeed, that 
can be readily appreciated if you load the mycopinosomes with a fluorescent probe. What is shown here are mycopinosomes at two different stages following the mycopinocytic event. And what should be apparent is that over the course of just a few minutes, the volume of the mycopinosome shrinks dramatically. And in the process, a fluorescent marker trapped in its lumen is concentrated, indicating that fluid has been extracted from the mycopinosome. As dramatic as the optic of fluid is during mycopinocytosis, so is the shrinkage of the resulting mycopinosomes, which in the long term prevents the swelling of the cells. As the graph to the right shows, you lose about 60 to 70% of the mycopinosome within five minutes. So if the volume of the mycopinosome is decreasing, then that implies that water is moving out of the mycopinosome. And if water is moving out, it must do so driven by the movement of osmotically active particles. And the reason we chose to study mycopinosomes is because as resulting from the optic of the extracellular space, we know precisely what is the composition of the lumen of a nascent mycopinosome. To the extent that the mycopinosome resulted from trapping of a global sample of the extracellular space, and because we dictate the composition of the space, we know that the vast majority of the osmolites are sodium and chlorine. We therefore hypothesized that in order to shrink the mycopinosome, sodium and chloride must be removed from within the mycopinosome, followed by osmotically obliged water. And that hypothesis is simple to test in the case of mycopinocytosis, because we can readily alter the composition of the extracellular space. And we can do that by replacing sodium by a large non-permeant cation, such as n methylglucammonium or chloride equally by a large impermeant organic anion like gluconate. And so we tested three different conditions, mycopinosomes formed in sodium chloride, in methyl glucomonium chloride, or sodium gluconate. The expectation being that large impermeant cations would affect the rate and extent to which the mycopinosome would shrink. What is shown in the bottom panels here is that indeed, Whereas the sodium chloride containing mycopinosome shrinks readily within a few minutes, as we illustrated before, the absence of an impermeant cation or the absence of a permeant cation or the absence of a permeant anion prevented the resorption and therefore the shrinkage of the mycopinosome. What I'm showing in these graphs are collected experiments from a number of different donors, where you can see that whereas in purple, the control mycopinosomes shrink very quickly, as I illustrated before, within five minutes, losing the bulk of their volume. When you don't have sodium in the medium or when you fail to add chloride, the shrinkage is largely inhibited, as is in the right panel, the resulting concentration of the fluorescent probe that became greater as water was removed in the control but fails to happen when sodium or chloride are omitted from the solution. And so what seems to be happening is that, whoops, following the formation of the large sodium chloride containing vacuole, ions are rapidly removed from the lumen of the mycopinosome. That implies the presence of transporting systems. What transporters could potentially account for this? Well, maybe co-transporters, symporters, or antiporters, like they're shown in the top right, or perhaps more efficiently, channels that would have a greater transport number. So what do we know about channels 
in internal membranes? Well, not terribly much, but we do know that in the endocytic pathway in general, there are two families of cation channels, the TRIP channels, particularly the TRIPML family, and the TPC or two pore channels. And remarkably, bioinformatic data shown to the right revealed that all of these channels are much more abundant, five to 10 times more abundant in macropinocytosing cells than in cells that don't normally affect macropinocytosis. So we have several possible cation channels, and one easy way to test for their involvement is to use pharmacology. And without belaboring the point, we tested a series of known inhibitors of ion channels to find that the trandrin, a blocker of two pore channels, was a very effective inhibitor at low concentrations of the resorption of the macropinosome, as shown in the bottom panel of this slide. To the left, you can see that macropinosomes have already shrunken after a while, and the intensity of the fluorophore has increased in the presence of the trandrin. The macropinosomes remain enlarged, and the fluorophore remains dilute. So what are two pore channels? As the name indicates, they are the result of a genetic duplication of a channel-like structure. They have multiple transmembrane domains and two pore-like structures. And germane to our studies, they seem to transport sodium much more efficiently than they do other cations like calcium, about 20 times more efficiently. So are two-pore channels present in macropinosomes? There are two kinds of two-pore channels, two-pore channel or TPC1 and TPC2. And as shown in this slide, TPC1 is recruited very promptly to the forming macropinosomes and remains there during the duration of their shrinkage. TPC2, which is present normally in later endocytic compartments, is also recruited, although it takes a few more minutes for it to become apparent in macropinosome. So at least anatomically, we know that the channels can be present in maturing macropinosomes. Whereas pharmacology is suggestive, a more direct way of proving the involvement of these channels is to silence their expression or to knock out the genes encoding for them. What we're showing in the slides to the left is a comparison of the extent of shrinkage of macropinosomes in control cells compared to cells that have been treated with an siRNA to silence the expression of TPC or two pore channel number one. And as the collated data on the right illustrate, there is a severe impairment of the shrinkage when TPC1 expression is inhibited. Moreover, we collaborated with Dr. Dejan Ren from the University of Pennsylvania, who had generated mice lacking TPC1 and or TPC2. And as these experiments show, double knockout mice fail to resorb and tubulate properly compared to wild type animals. So we're fairly confident that sodium transporting two pore channels seem to be required for the remodeling of the macropinus. An interesting feature of the two pore channels is that they require the presence, yet again, of a specific phosphoinositide. In this case, it's phosphatidinositol 3,5-bisphosphate. As the graph underneath shows, which is taken from the literature, in the absence of PI35P2, the channel is virtually inert. Other phosphodocytides like PI45P2 are ineffective, but in the presence of PI35P2, the channel opens and becomes conductive. Just as a reminder, PI35P2 is a unique endomembrane phosphodocytide generated by the phosphorylation of PI3P by 
a kinase called PIK5. The resulting lipid, PI35P2, has been described exclusively in endomembrane compartments. And so we ask naturally, is the substrate, PI3P, present? Is the enzyme that generates PI35P2, namely PIK5, present? And is PI35P2 itself generated on mycopinazone, which would seem to be required for activation of the two pore channels? What is shown in the leftmost panel is a probe for the presence of PI3P, which is clearly very prominent and generated very early in the formation of mycopinosomes prior to their shrinkage. The enzyme that can convert PI3P, PIK5, is also recruited rapidly by mycopinosome. And as suggested by yet another probe, it's conceivable that PI35P2 is also present there. And I say conceivable because there are some questions as to the reliability of the probe to measure PI35P2, which at present is the only one available. If indeed we need PI35P2 to activate the two pore channels, and the two pore channels are required for the shrinkage, one would predict that inhibition of the formation of PI35P2 would in turn prevent the shrinkage of the mycopinosome. And luckily, there is an entire family, in fact, several families of very potent and specific inhibitors of PIK5. We tested the one shown on the slide and assessed the ability of the mycopinosomes to resorb. And as shown in the bottom left, the mycopinosomes not only fail to shrink, but in fact continue to swell upon addition of the inhibitor of PIK5. Bringing you back to the notion that shrinkage of mycopinosomes is associated with changes in the surface to volume ratio, and that tubulation of the mycopinosome seems to be essential for the processing of the material within the mycopinosome, we tested whether tubulation was indeed prevented by inhibiting the removal of sodium chloride from the lumen of the mycopinosome. And what is shown on the left is a controlled situation where sodium chloride was taken up into the mycopinosome. What is shown to the right is a mycopinosome form in medium devoid of sodium. And what you can see is that the failure of the mycopinosome to shrink, which is apparent by its size and by the concentration of the fluorophore, is accompanied by its inability to tubulate, so that the conversion from a sphere to a tubule requires the abstraction of volume and the change in surface to volume ratio. And the tubulation is therefore inhibited not only by removal of sodium, but also by the inhibitor of PIK5 or by the blocker of the channel detractor. What's the biological significance of this whole process? Well, not only antigen presentation or delivery of inflammatory mediators to TLR and other receptors, but to the extent that the entire plasma membrane is being recycled every 20 to 30 minutes, it is imperative that the tubulation process be functional to recycle plasma level compo components to the plasma membrane, lest they get trapped inside the cell. And indeed, we could show this quite readily by looking at a membrane protein that is known to be continuously internalized yet rapidly recycled to the membrane in the case of macrophages. When an integrin is labeled on the surface of a normally treated macrophage, the bulk of it appears on its surface. If, however, we prevent the shrinkage of the mycopinosome by inhibiting PIK5 or by other means, we find that Whereas the mycopinocytosis is ongoing, the shrinkage, tubulation, and recycling are inhibited so that 
essential plasma membrane components get trapped in endomembrane compartments. So, in summary, what I've been trying to tell you is that there are important and ongoing alterations in the structure of endomembrane compartments. That in many cases, vacuoles or largely spherical compartments become tubular and that that entails changes in the surface to volume ratio. And that the best way to accomplish that is by removal of water and volume from the spherical compartments. And that has to be driven by the preceding movement of specific osmolites. In the case of macrinosomes and presumably also endosomes, sodium and chloride are the primary osmolites. And by being transported down their gradients out of the macropinosome or the endosome into the cytosol, they will drag osmotically obliged water with them. In the process, the membrane will shrink. And interestingly, shrinkage of the membrane generates curvature. And that curvature is required and stabilized by the binding of proteins that have curvature recognition domains, such as the bar domains of SNCs, endophilin, or amphiphysin proteins. And so we believe that the actual sequence of events is such that spheres become crenated, corrugated a little bit, dimply, by virtue of a loss of volume that is osmotically driven. And that induced small curvature is stabilized and magnified and enlarged by the binding of proteins such as bar domain containing proteins that recognize, bind to, and stabilize and extend the tubules that emanate from vesicular compartments. So in finishing, I just want to acknowledge some of the people in my laboratory during the years that have contributed to the detection of phosphonocytes in different compartments. Phil Ostrowski for the work on polysome-like structures, Spencer Freeman for the work on macrobinocytosis and our collaborators. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Grinstein, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. As a final reminder, Dr. Grinstein will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.